service and the common good. Um, she has uh, her latest book um, is called American Nuremberg: The Officials Who Should Stand Trial for Post 9/11 War Crimes. Um, prior to her academic career, Gordon spent a few decades working in a variety of national and international movements for peace and justice. These include the movement for women's liberation and LGBT rights, movement in solidarity with the, strugg solidarity with the struggles of poor people in Central America, the anti-apartheid anti movement in the United States and South Africa, and movements opposing U.S. wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. In Afghanistan. In 1984, Gordon spent six months living in the war zones of Nicaragua, and in 1990, three months teaching desktop publishing at an anti-apartheid newspaper in Cape Town, South Africa. She is a founder of Californians for Justice, a statewide organization dedicated to the political enfranchisement of marginalized people, especially young people, poor people, and people. Um, other organizations she has worked with include the Applied Research Center, the Center for Third World Third World Organizing, um, and the Asian Pacific Environmental Network. She is the editor of War Times, Tiempo de Guerras, which seeks to bring a race, class, and gender perspective to issues of war and peace. So please welcome Rebecca Gordon. <laughs> when you're old, you've done a lot of things. <laughs> so, you know, and I've had a really great life. And I was saying at dinner tonight, I have the best job in the world. I get to talk with young people about their deepest values just at the time of their lives when they're trying to figure that out. Because at the college where I teach, everybody has to pass a semester of ethics to graduate. <laughs> and so they have to come see me or someone like me. So, antes de todo, before everything else, I want to really thank Blake and I want to thank the JCB, uh, Johnny College Board, for inviting me and making it possible for me to come today. I've always actually been really fascinated by St. John's um, because one of the things that they don't teach you in graduate school is how to teach. And so when I got, it was time for me to learn to teach, all I knew was what I had learned about popular education in Central America. And I still use some of those methods in my classes. But St. John's has an idea, has a whole theory of pedagogy that has always amazed me. And so I've always wanted to visit. I've always wanted to meet people who go here. And so I'm really grateful for the opportunity. So thank you. So I want to do three things tonight. And I want to also have plenty of time for us to have some conversation if you like. But I want to do three things. First, I want to talk about what torture really is. And I don't mean the rhinestone studded virgin that you see in Zero 30 or 24 or Homeland. I'm not talking about the lonely hero who all by himself saves Los Angeles from a ticking time bomb, because that's not what torture is. So I'm going to give you my definition of torture, and I'm going to explain why it's not an episode, but it's an ongoing socially embedded practice. Then I want to talk a little bit, um, partly because I was asked to, but also because nobody else but an audience like you is interested in this, about just briefly what I think is wrong with some of the common ethical approaches to the problem of torture. And I'm thinking here specifically of utilitarianism and Immanuel Kant's um, deontology. And why I think that although you can get at some things that are part of the problem of torture, you really can't get at everything. And then finally, I'm going to spend quite a bit of time talking about the connection in the United States between torture and race and racism. Because both in the US war on terror, as we call it, and here at home, those two things are deeply, intimately connected. And I'm going to talk about why. Sound good? Okay. So what is torture? I said it's not Jack Bauer saving Los Angeles on 24. We have to stop thinking of torture as a series of isolated actions that are taken by heroic individuals in moments of extreme danger when there's no other alternative. We need to begin to understand it as a socially embedded practice. 
institutional state torture, which is what I'm talking about, has its own histories, its own traditions, its own rituals of initiation, ways that people are brought into the practice and taught the values that are internal to that practice. It encourages both in the people who learn to become practitioners of torture and, I'm going to argue, in the society that makes a home for it, certain moral habits. And for those of you who've read Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics, when I talk about moral habits, I'm talking about virtues and vices, ways of being in the world. And the reason that I wrote this book, Mainstreaming Torture, is that it was really clear to me from almost the day after September 11th that whatever the US response to those terrible attacks was going to be, part of it was going to involve torturing somebody. And as early as November 5th, there was an article in Newsweek by a, a liberal historian named Jonathan Alter. And what he said was, the title of it was Time to Think About Torture. Who did he want to torture? Well, a lot of people don't know this, but right after, or don't remember, right after September 11th, the FBI rounded up about 600 Muslims who were living in the United States. Most of them were here legally on green cards or with visas. Some, about 40%, had perhaps overstayed their visas, which is true for many, many people living in the United States. They were taken to a jail in Brooklyn. They were held incommunicado. They were not allowed to communicate with anyone. Their families didn't know where they were. They couldn't talk to a lawyer. They were beaten. They were chained to radiators. They were set outside in the February cold wearing nothing but hospital gowns. They were tortured for six months, literally within sight of the Statue of Liberty. These people were the people Jonathan Alter was saying should be tortured in order to find out who was responsible for September 11th. Not one of these people was ever, ever indicted or tried or in any way found to have anything to do with September 11th or terror, terrorism in general. But he was already, already so frustrated that he had not, we had not yet figured out who was responsible for what he called the greatest crime in American history. Now, some people might have thought, oh, I don't know annihilation of um, the native people, or maybe the enslavement of African people was a great crime, but for Alter, the greatest crime in American history. And if people weren't <coughs> talking, then they needed to be tortured. As time went on, this we began to see in the newspapers, and you didn't have to look far. By 2002, when the United States was already in Afghanistan, you could read articles in the Washington Post about people who were being subjected by the CIA at Bagram Air Force Base to what they then called stress and duress. And all you had to do was read a little bit through the lines, and you knew what was going on. So this huge secret was no secret at all. It was in the mainstream press. But as I was saying to folks at dinner, it seems to me that over the last 15 years, ever since those attacks, and I have friends who lost their son in the 9-11 attacks. So it's not like I don't think those were terrible, that, that was a terrible thing, I do. But in those 15 years, we have been convinced that we need to be afraid and that we should constantly be afraid of this thing we call terrorism. And whenever we forget, we get reminded. You go to the airport, you go through security, you take off your shoes, you take off your belt, you put your liquids in a, you know, an exactly quart-sized baggie. You, are constantly reminded, and some people call this security theater, right? Because it is, it's a performance of reminding you that you are in terrible danger and only your government can protect you. And part of the deal that the government has been offering us for the last 15 years is you let us do whatever we need to do over here on the dark side. And in return, our promise to you essentially is you will never die. You will always be 100% secure. I hate to break it to you, but all of us in this room are going to die someday. <laughs> it's a fake promise, but we've bought into it, many of us. And this fear is part of what creates space for allowing 
a practice like torture. So what do I mean by institutionalized state torture? Here's the definition. It's the intentional infliction of severe mental or physical pain, suffering, by an official or agent of a political entity, which results in dismantling the victim's sensory, psychological, and social worlds with the purpose of establishing or maintaining the power of that political entity. So let's unpack that. The first part, the intentional infliction of severe mental or physical suffering is language that comes from the United Nations Convention Against Torture and Other Cruel, Inhuman, and Degrading Treatment, which the United States has signed. There are many people in this country who are great patriots but are not terribly fond of the Constitution. In the Constitution, in Article 6, it says explicitly that any treaty that is ratified by the Senate becomes the supreme law of the land. In other words, when we signed a treaty saying we weren't going to torture people, that treaty became part of the law of the US. In addition, we, we um, in the late 90s, the, the Congress passed what's called implementing legislation, laws that are supposed to put in every country that signs the, the treaty, put it into effect. Among the things that we're supposed to do is bring people to justice if they commit the crime of torture, which you may have noticed that with the exception of some very low level soldiers in Iraq, we have not done. Um, but that law that defines torture for the United States, and it's section 2441 of the US Criminal Code, like any law, it can be interpreted. It's open to interpretations. So in 2002, Jay Bybee, and John Yu, who were working for the person who was the counsel for the president at that point, who was George W. Bush. The counsel's name was Alberto Gonzalez. So these two guys wrote a famous memo. And in the memo, they were responding to questions, basically from the CIA, about how do we interpret this really strange language, severe mental or physical suffering? What, what can that possibly, and intentional infliction? What could those words possibly mean? And so they wrote this memo in which they said, well, for it to be severe physical suffering, the pain involved would have to be as great as anything that you would experience in the case of organ failure or even death. He didn't die, <coughs> you didn't torture. In the case of mental suffering, the effects would have to last for decades. Well, it's very hard to tell in the moment, whether or not something you are going to do to something is going to continue to affect that person for decades, right? I mean, you can make a pretty good guess that sleep deprivation, waterboarding, um, stress positions, which I'll talk about in a minute, that all of those things would perhaps have a lengthy psychological effect, but you can't do it. And then there was this little question intentional, the intentional infliction. And what they said about that was, well, it really only counts as intentional if the pain, if the purpose of the torture is just to cause pain for its own sake. In other words, if you had any other purpose, like, oh, I don't know, supposedly getting someone to give you information, then it's not intentional infliction of pain. It's like, um, you know, Thomas Aquinas would say it's the law of double effect, right? What ends up happening is, oh, the side effect of this crucial piece of activity is that somebody is in terrible pain, but that wasn't the primary purpose. So basically, if you were only doing it for fun, it would count. Otherwise, it's legal. Okay. So that's the legal definition. There's a lot more I can say. There are actually many laws and treaties that, that cover that stuff. But I also said that torture results in dismantling the target's sensory, psychological, temporal, and social. So let me talk about this a little bit. Um, there's a philosopher named Elaine Scarry, S-C-A-R-R-Y, who wrote a great book called The Body and the Pain. And in the beginning, she talks about torture. And one of the things she talks about is how torture, in the moment, extreme, terrible physical pain. Has anybody here ever had really, really bad physical pain? Okay, so you know, in that moment, you can't think about anything else. 
it completely has all of your attention. And when that happens, at the same time, you lose the capacity for language. All you can do is scream. And when you lose your capacity for language, you are also losing the way that most of us interact with the world. We constantly interpret the world through a stream of language that passes through our minds. Sometimes we're aware of it, sometimes we're not. People who are great meditators can actually shut it off. I can't. But when you lose that, you lose your connection to the physical world. There's a, um, a theologian named William Cavanaugh who describes it this way. He says it's as though the whole world shrinks down to the contours of your body. That is the world. In the same way, you lose the extension of your life in time. It's like there's no past and there's no future. There's only now. You also lose, and this is really crucial, you lose your social connections. Most, much, much of torture goes on in a situation in which the person who is being tortured over a period of time only really has contact with the people who are tormenting or her. And so your entire social world becomes that person. Furthermore, although the purpose of torture is not information, and I'll talk about that in a sec, Nonetheless, sooner or later, most people who are being tortured will say something. They'll give up a name. They'll give up an address. They'll say where a safe house is, something like that. And over and over again, what they hear back is, we all knew that. We wanted to hear you say it. Why? Because now that person has betrayed the people that are closest to them, has betrayed the members of their union or their sewing cooperative or even their jihadist self, whatever it is that is their deepest connection that they care most about, the thing that got them into this situation in the first place, and very often also their own family members, their own sons and daughters. And once you have betrayed those people, you have lost your own social connection. But then, this is the next part, torture only has its real effect if it's not a complete secret. Just as here in the United States, we knew that we must be in terrible danger because our good government was being forced to do terrible things. In the same way, in many, many torture regimes, what happens is some of the disappeared are put back out on the street. And people can see what's happened to them. And their organization and the members of their organization avoid them. And the suspicion goes around, what did they say? Who did they betray? What did they give up? And the suspicion builds inside the organization, and it tears the organization apart from the inside out. And in effect, what torture is, is a way of attacking cohesive social bodies by attacking, attacking the bodies of the individuals who make up those social bodies that might be in a position to resist the regime. So that brings me to the last part the purpose of torture. We're told that torture is to get information. And I'll be happy to talk about this more when we have a conversation afterwards. But torture is actually a really bad way to get information. First of all, it takes too long if what you want is information that you need right now. Secondly, what's been shown is that establishing a rapport with somebody is a much better way to get them to talk to you and give you information than hurting them. And in fact, one of the things the CIA discovered when they did research and paid for academic research in the 1950s and 60s on torture is that the most effective kind of torture is the kind that you force a person to do to himself. And so they, said, they saw that if people are hurt by outsiders, they resist. But that's why stress positions, which sound like not a big deal, right? You're get a nice stretch maybe, or you know, you stay in this position for a while. But what happens is, you folks are all sitting, but as you're sitting and listening to me talk, you are constantly readjusting your body. A tendon gets tired, a muscle gets tired, a bone starts to be tired, and you move around. But if you can't move, what very quickly starts to happen 
is that pain in the spine and in the muscles and in the bones becomes as bad as anything you can do to someone with electric current, but it doesn't leave a mark. And the psychological effect is that they're doing it to themselves. You can read all about this in a manual that the CIA produced called the KUBARK, K-U-B-A-R-K manual. It's available online. Parts of it have been declassified. The first version came out in 1963. The second version came out in 1983. And it was actually used in Honduras by the Americans who were training the army the US was illegally supporting to overthrow the government of Nicaragua. So the reason that I pay attention to this strange issue, torture, is partly because of the people I met in the 1980s who had been tortured and people who had been kidnapped, taken to Honduras, tortured themselves, and then turned into soldiers and sent back into Nicaragua to do the same thing to other people. So the purpose of torture, essentially, is by creating terror and fear in a society to either establish or to maintain the power of the regime that's doing it. And I would say that this is true, even if you want to talk about place organizations like um, ISIS, that the public cruelty has exactly the same purpose and the same effect, to create the kind of fear that's going to prevent people from doing it. So there, essentially, we have this definition of torture. It is the intentional infliction of severe mental or physical suffering by an official or agent of some political entity, usually a government, which results in dismantling the victim's sensory, psychological, and social worlds with the purpose of establishing or maintaining that entity's power. So I wrote a book about this. And when I wrote it, I was hoping to reach out. It was published by Oxford, so it was an academic. And I was hoping to reach out to academics, but also to ordinary people, to think about this problem, this problem which I really do believe is not something that happens suddenly in a sudden moment. And let me just say quickly about why I think that. Torture requires an infrastructure. It literally requires a built infrastructure. So for example, we hear early on from um, a man named Abu Zubeda, who was, one of, who was the very first person to be waterboarded by the CIA. But they also did other things to him, including slamming his head into a concrete wall. And he describes in his diary, which was gotten out by his, um, his attorneys, how this slamming the back of his head, the first time they did it, they just it was just concrete. Then they put him in this um, little like three foot high enclosed black box for hours on end. He couldn't sit, he couldn't stand. And then they brought him out again for more slamming into the wall. But by then they had replaced, they had put a piece of plywood, plywood over the wall. Because according to the memo they got from the CIA, the memo they got from the Office of Legal Counsel, they were allowed to do this as long as there was a flexible wall. So that, I don't know how if you've ever like banged into a piece of you know, half-inch plywood. But flexible is not the word I would use. So it requires a built structure. It also requires people who know what they're doing. And in fact, the CIA, although they wrote the book in the 60s and, and again in the 80s, seems to have forgotten what they knew. Because they had to hire outside experts. They hired two psychologists, a man named Bruce Jesser, Jessen and a man named uh, James Mitchell. And these psychologists were brought in to design the torture program, the enhanced interrogation program. They're the people who brought in waterboarding and actually oversaw the first waterboarding. And I'm actually sitting on an ethics commission for the American Psychological Association, which is trying to figure out how a member of their association actually was involved in designing this torture program and managed to make, remain a member of the organization and some other stuff like it looks like maybe the Department of Defense actually helped write part of the ethics code 
to allow psychologists to participate in, in interrogations. Okay, so it requires this infrastructure. It requires people who are trained, who know what they're doing. You can't just suddenly invent it on the fly. And like any kind of physical skill, it requires practice. Um, and it's socially embedded, meaning that it exists in the context of a larger society which in to one extent or another knows that it's happening. And so when you treat torture as a question of should I torture this terrorist in front of me who I am absolutely 100% certain knows where the bomb is and it's going to go off in two hours in order to save 100,000 people. That's a nice, neat, hypothetical question and it has nothing to do with what torture really is because that doesn't happen. That's not when people get tortured. People get tortured when they are picked up because they are either members of organizations or in the case of people in Afghanistan, they're sold by their neighbor who doesn't like them and they are kept for a period of months and years. It's not, if you know the bomb's gonna go off in two hours, then the, that's the time when you're most likely to be able to hold out if you're the person being tortured. And if you didn't have that infrastructure and the people who knew how to do it in the first place, which requires a whole form of initiation and training, then you wouldn't know how to do it. You wouldn't know what to do. Okay, so. When I went and looked at what ethicists were writing about torture in the period after September 11th, it was really interesting, at least to an ethicist. Um, first of all, in my field, there's a big divide. There's what's called theoretical ethics and applied ethics. See if you can guess which one has the more intellectual cachet, which is considered real philosophy, applied ethics. So there were all these people like this guy Fritz Alhoff writing theories of ethics saying, you know, about torture saying, but I'm not really interested in the question of torture. I'm just using it as an example to show that Immanuel Kant was wrong about the categorical imperative. And yet in the very abstract of his same article, he says, oh, the people at Guantanamo might be interested in reading this to see what I think about it. So, the point being that for a lot of ethicists, it became an interesting theoretical question. Should we do this? Obviously, for the people who were doing it and the people who were having it done to them, it wasn't a theoretical question at all. So what's wrong with an, a utilitarian approach to torture? Well, the first problem is it treats each individual act as if you could look at it and ask, you know, will doing this lead to the greatest good for the greatest number of people? But as I said before, that's not what torture is. It's not this isolated action. It's this ongoing practice in which people learn and they develop certain qualities. And one of those qualities is a kind of a perversion of one of the four great, the four classic virtues. It's a perversion of courage. What you learn to be brave about is other people's pain. Because a lot of us have a sort of natural reaction of, an aversion when someone is in pain. And people like doctors and nurses and surgeons have to learn to get over that in order to be able to do their work, and so do torturers, but for a different reason. So you get this perversion of torture. But the deontologist is just going to ask, you know, if I throw the switch, will five people die or one person die? Torture is not like that. We also have utilitarian arguments for torture. And those arguments mostly run like this. We need to obey the Geneva Conventions and the other, the other treaties that we have so signed in how we treat people that we've picked up on the battlefield. Because otherwise, if our soldiers are picked up, then they also are going to be liable to be tortured. So it's, it's not strictly utilitarian, but it's definitely consequentialist. It's you judge the action based on the consequence. And one bad consequence is it hurts us. Another thing that I saw happen a lot is that utilitarianism was kind of sliding over into another form of consequentialism, which I would call nationalism, which essentially says, 
not the greatest good for the greatest number of human beings or persons or entities, but the greatest good for the greatest number of Americans. And in case you hadn't noticed, we are something like 4% of the population on this planet, those of us who are American. So a consequentialist ethics that only focuses on people of one country is not utilitarian, whatever else it is. OK, there are some powerful deontological arguments against torture. The most obvious, how many of you have read um, Foundations of the Metaphysics of Morals? Have you gotten there yet? OK, so when I say categorical imperative, you're not going to go, hmm? All right. I ask my students sometimes when I run into them a semester later, so, you know, on campus, so tell me the first formulation of the categorical imperative. And they're like, go away. But <laughs> one of the things that Kant says is that we must never treat humanity, that is, human nature, our capacity for rational whether it's our own humanity or that of someone else, as if it were simply an instrument to get something else we want, rather than as an end in itself. So torture, in a way, is the quintessential form of doing that. You are taking a human being, and you are turning not only his body, but his mind or her mind against her, in that you are getting her to betray the thing that she considers to be the most valuable, her own causes, the things that she cares about. And so torture in this sense is, is really using another person's rational capacity absolutely to serve a purpose and only a purpose and not treating them as valuable in themselves. And this is a strong argument. But again, it only treats an act that you're doing in the moment and it doesn't touch on the effects that having this ongoing practice implanted in your society has not only on the people who have to do this as their job, but also on the rest of us to the extent we know that it's happening and we allow ourselves to ignore it. So deontological approaches, there's something there. There are other people who've talked about deontology in the larger sense of being an ethics of duty. And so Jean Baker Alstein, um, who's now deceased, uh, a conservative um, modern philosopher, says, well, you know, until 9-11, I never believed, I was one of those never torture people. You know, never do it. But then after 9-11, I decided, well, maybe we need to rethink this. And then she gives an example that has nothing to do with 9-11. She says, suppose there is a terrorist, and you absolutely know this person knows where the bomb is, and it's been planted in one of the elementary schools in your city. You have two hours. Don't you have a duty of care to torture that person to find out where the bomb is? And this is the problem with this stuff that's called quandary ethics. It's not real. Obviously, the thing you would do is evacuate every grade school, you know, every school in the city. That's what you would do, and that you would have time for. Even if you got your answers, you might not have time to get rid of this bomb. The, the, the reality is, again, it's not going to happen. And the other question I have is, how do you have this epistemic certainty that the person in front of you actually has the information you want? Supposedly, that's what we have trials for, right? And they go on for months. Not to mention, how do you know the guy isn't going to just as a wonderful philosopher, Henry Hsu, says, vomit and die instead of telling you what you want. So I don't think that these are the best ways of approaching the problem of ethics. And so when I talk about what pro approach I would take, I say, let's look at a modern form of virtue ethics. So how many of you have done Aristotle again? OK. All right, so done, read, excuse me. So Aristotle's form of virtue ethics, you're going to see it again when you read St. Thomas Aquinas, when you read the Summa Theologica. But after Thomas, and especially in the modern period, we don't really talk about the virtues very, more, very much anymore. All of our ethics is focused on specific acts. But in the 1980s, a guy named Alistair McIntyre, who's um, from Scotland, 
wrote a book called After Virtue. And it's basically an indictment of enlightenment ethics and everything he considers wrong with it. But in that process, he says, what we really need to do is reclaim Aristotle's understanding of virtue and more than that, of telos, of the idea that life has purpose. And you know, Aristotle starts out the Nicomachean Ethics asking what is the purpose of life. And he goes on to approach it several different ways, and he comes up with the answer of eudaimonia, or happiness, or flourishing, right? Um, so what McIntyre says is, well, the piece that he adds is, it's helpful to think of our lives almost as a narrative, as a story. And of a particular kind of story, it's a quest. And in a sense, it's a quest for the answer to the question, what is a good life for human beings? And in that context, and he says, it's not something we start de novo. We do that in the context of living within traditions that are ongoing arguments about this question, and in societies that have answers to that question. But as we go forward, we develop practices. And practices are complex collaborative activities that require you to work with other human beings. They're difficult, they're complicated. An example might be playing chess. An example might be not chopping vegetables, but really good cooking. Or my favorite, because I'm a knitter, knitting. Which sounds incredibly simple. You're just pulling loops of string from loops of string. But it has a tradition, it has a history, it has a worldwide community of people who share um, the interest, and it has certain, and this is the other piece, it's in the context of doing these practices that we develop our virtues. That they are qualities, habits that we develop. So one of the virtues you develop in knitting is a certain form of self-criticism that allows you to look at a piece, recognize an error, and make a decision about whether you have to tear the whole thing back or not, or whether you can live with the mistake. It also requires, you know, a certain kind of stamina, a, a bunch of different things. But other kinds of, take, take professional football, um, an activity that I cannot justify my enjoyment of watching, but there it is. We all live with contradictions. <laughs> um, but that's a practice absolutely complex, absolutely collaborative, requires tremendous teamwork, tremendous physical courage, tremendous intellectual skills, right? And you develop certain capacities, certain virtues, these habits in that. So my argument is that when you live in a society that says that torture is the price of my security and it's a price I'm willing for someone else to pay, then um, you develop certain habits. And one of them is what I would call, well, you know, we have a word in English for people who say, do whatever it takes to keep me safe. We call people like that cowards. So the original working title for my book was A Nation of Cowards. But the publisher thought that was over the top, so <laughs> there we go. But I think it's true. I think we've been trained in cowardice. And it affects not only how we react to ac actions and activities that happen outside the United States, how willing we are to deploy our military all over the world, but it also affects how we react to events here in the United States. And that's where I want to talk about the third part of, of, my, of my talk. So, you know, we're living through this election period, and we are hearing one of the two main candidates say things that I never expected a Republican to admit in public to the entire world that he believed. Um, I think probably a lot of people believe these things, but he's articulating them and making it acceptable again to express racism, to express xenophobia, to express um, you know, a hatred for people of color. And he's doing this and I don't know if any of you saw his speech at the Republican convention, but he is doing this by stoking our fear. The same fear, both of terrorists abroad, we're now meant to have that fear, and it's true. You know, and here's the truth. There's nothing we can do that will prevent 
absolutely some angry, disaffected young man from getting one of the many available weapons in this country, and some young women, and going and doing something horrible. It happened in Oregon today. Um, so, so we can't prevent all of that, but Trump is stoking that fear. And that fear and that willingness to torture, I now want to argue, is deeply connected to the very beginning of our history. So, in every society that decides it's going to torture people, they don't torture everybody. A certain group of people gets picked out, and they are identified as legitimate targets. Everybody doesn't deserve it, but these people deserve it. And then, in the public mind, they are images of them are created as not entirely human. So, for example, in Chile, under the Pinochet regime, the people who were tortured who were mostly leftists, were called humanoid. The implication being that they were sort of human, but not quite human. In Brazil, under the generals in the 1960s and 70s, with US training, they actually treated people they tortured as worse than those frogs that you dissect in biology class. Because what the police would do in Brazil is go out at night and scoop up people who were so poor they lived on the streets and bring them in front of the police cadets and torture them as a way of teaching people. So they became demonstration dummies. They were not human. They were filth. They were vermin. They were dangerous. But they were whatever they were, they were not human. The most famous picture from Abu Ghraib is a picture of a woman named Lindy, Lindy um, England. With, um, with an Iraqi man on all fours with a collar around his neck, and she's holding him on a leash. And she's walking him like a dog. If you treat human beings as dogs, and you allow the image to penetrate to the public, it has this bizarre effect. You might think that the first reaction is going to be sympathy, and maybe it will be. But in many people, there's also a disgust that a human being would allow that to be done to them. It proves that they are animals because they let us treat them like animals. And this is the logic. And it doesn't work necessarily at the level of propositional calculus, but it works at the emotional level. Because wouldn't you rather think somebody deserved it than think I'm in some way responsible for this? Doesn't it feel better to think, well, they deserved it? So. In the United States, there are two groups of people who, from the very beginning, from before there even was a United States, have been identified as not entirely human. The first of those were the native people who were already living here when people got here from Europe. And the second group are the Africans who were brought here to work as slaves um, in the farming industry before and after the foundation of the country. And when I say that African Americans, enslaved Africans, were less than human. This is literally true, because in the Constitution, enslaved Africans counted as three-fifths of a person for the purposes of deciding how many representatives each state would get in the House of Representatives. They didn't count as complete people, because they weren't. But what's that got to do with torture? So, there's a really good book by a guy named Edmund Morgan, and it's a, it's a slightly old book now, but um, it's called American Freedom, American Slavery, American Freedom. And what he does is he takes the example of Virginia and uses it to show how the entire United States was built on the labor of enslaved people, and um, and as part of that, he describes how torture is built in at the very beginning. So in Virginia, the cash crop was tobacco. And tobacco was a very labor-intensive crop. And they didn't have enough people to work the crop. So in England, what they would do is they would go around and they would pick up vagrants and ship them over to the colonies. And some of them came voluntarily and some of them came involuntarily. But they all had to work seven years. And then they got a bunch of land and a mule and were allowed to work the land and become farmers themselves. When the farmers began to bring in people from Africa, 
they didn't get the same deal. They weren't going to work any seven years or ten years and then be released and have a farm of their own. They were going to work their entire lives and their children were going to work their entire lives and their children's children were going to work their entire lives. And what they found out was there was no incentive for them to do anything at all except for the incentive of pain. And so at the very beginning, whipping, mutilations, brandings, um, the use of the use of um, iron irons to, to to hold people, shackles, all of that is built into to the economics of slavery at the very beginning. From the beginning, black bodies are bodies that it is legitimate to torture because they aren't really human anyway. This gets worse as the cotton crop develops. So there's another book, and this is a relatively new book. It's an amazing book. It's a horrifying book by a man named Edward Baptiste, and it's called The Half Has Never Been Told, Slavery and the Making of American Capitalism. And it is about how the work of enslaved laborers, laborers actually created the capital that built the United States, and not only the South, where the cotton was being grown, but the North, where the cotton was being milled and woven and shipped around the world. It all depended ultimately on enslaved people. So in The Half Has Never Been Told, Baptiste talks about what the cotton farmers called the pushing system. And this is the system that they used to make people work. And the idea is, um, it was essentially an organized technology of cruelty to get the maximum labor possible from enslaved people. He calls it a system that extracted more work by using oppressively direct supervision combined with torture. He goes on. In the context of the pushing system, the whip was in, as important to making cotton grow as sunshine and rain. In 1849, a migrating South Carolina planter hired a Mississippi overseer, because Mississippi and Louisiana were the places where this system first developed, um, to ensure that his hands, that is, his human beings, would be followed up from daybreak until dark, as is the custom here. The o overseer would drive each four row in a vast and easily surveyed field, and he would whip up those who fell behind. All that pushing, the owner calculated, would force, quote, my Negroes, to do twice as much here as Negroes generally do in North Carolina. And this technology of cruelty forced people to do, to learn to pick cotton faster than any machine can do it today. And so between 1801 and 1840, the average amount of cotton that one human being could pick per day went from 28 pounds to as much as 341 pounds all because people knew that when they fell behind, they would be tortured. It wouldn't have worked. They couldn't have gotten that level of labor out of human beings if they hadn't tortured them. So torture and black bodies from the very beginning. OK, but it doesn't end with emancipation. After emancipation comes a new system called convict leasing. And under convict leasing, which existed up until 1940 in this country, but it really took after, off after the end of Reconstruction, after 1901, when the Jim Crow laws really settled in in the South. And what would happen is you would be arrested for the most minor of crimes, making an insolent gesture, something like that. And then you were taken to the county jail or to the state penitentiary. The state then turned around and leased you, rented you out like a Xerox machine, to farmers, oftentimes the very same farmers who had been your masters before emancipation. And the very same treatment went on, only now you were the prisoner of the state instead of the prisoner of an individual. This kind of convict labor built the steel industry that built the industrial south. Birmingham, Alabama was built on leased convict labor 
that went down into the coal mines, risked their lives involuntarily, and were beaten when they failed to produce their quotas. It's the same thing, only slavery by another name, which is, by the way, the title of another good book, Slavery by Another Name. Um, after that, or in context of that, comes the terrorism that is organized, state-approved lynching. So if you've heard about lynching, you've heard probably that people got hung from trees. And that's true. But most lynching involved other forms of torture in addition. It, in, it involved branding, in the case of male people, oftentimes castration while the person was still alive, and very often burning to death. And this was not a rare event. There's one documentation project has documented 4,000 cases in a 40-year span. Um, it was something that you knew could happen to you, and it worked exactly the way torture is supposed to work, by frightening people from resisting the oppression that they were living with by knowing, because they knew that something much worse would happen to them if they organized or if they lifted a hand. Socially embedded. These events were activities of entertainment for white Southerners. They would literally bring picnics to the park to watch this happen. And the reason that we know this is that they documented it. They took photographs. And then they would take their pictures into town and have them developed at the local photo studio and turned into postcards, which they would send around to their friends and family around the country. Look at the fun that we had on Saturday afternoon. There are collections of these postcards available on, online. There are people who have made them available. And it's, it's horrific. Um, black people in this country begged and begged the federal government to make lynching a federal crime. It wasn't until we were in World War I, World War II, that that actually happened. And yet people were lynched also, Latinos were lynched to a lesser extent in Southern California. And um, as recently as 1982, when I moved to San Francisco in the black city of Richmond, California, across the bay from San Francisco, a young man who was transsexual, a guy who we only know his male name, Timothy Lee, African-American transsexual, male to female, was Lynch. She was hung from a tree in the parking lot of a of a bank. So it's it's something that has a long history and casts a long shadow. So I'm going to finish by talking about one other and deeply connected site where torture goes on every single day on a daily basis, and we usually don't even think about it. And that's in the jails and the so, there are 2.2 million people in prison in the U.S., largest number of prisoners in the world, by far the largest percentage of the population in prison, Vast, vastly disproportionately men of color, African Americans, and Latinos. And in prison, and we can talk more about this in the conversation, I'll just name a few of the ways that people get tortured. In southern prisons, it's the basics. It's whippings, it's using cattle prods and electric shock, it's exposing people to huge extremes of heat and cold, it's all the things, it's sleep deprivation, it's all the things that we saw um, people, the US doing in the war on terror. There are two other forms of torture that go on all the time. One is solitary confinement. And we now are beginning to understand that as Aristotle said, human beings are social animals. And we very quickly, within a couple of weeks, approach psychosis. We begin to hallucinate. We lose our minds when we are deprived of contact with other members of our species. And yet, there are people in Louisiana who have been in solitary confinement for 40 years. There are people in California, in Pelican Bay prison, who've been 20, 130 years. And we don't know how many people around the country. There are about 25,000 in federal prison, 
who are in solitary all the time, and maybe 80,000 total. We don't know. The other thing is rape. And rape in prison is so common that it's a joke on television. Every SVU, right, they threaten the perp that if he wants a lawyer, well, we'll have to send you to Rikers Island overnight. And a pretty boy like you, I don't want to think about what's going to happen to you there. It's a joke. But it's a joke because people know that it's true. And it's organized. It's organized by the guards as a means of maintaining control. Rape of women usually happens by employees, <coughs> corrections employees, rape, rape of guards happens by the guards. Amnesty International did a really good study a few years ago called Not Part of My Sentence that documents the systematic use of rape in US prisons. And again, who's in jail? Why are people in jail legitimate targets of torture? Well, part of the reason is because of who it is that's in the jails. And this isn't new. This goes all the way back to the very beginning of the country. So now you know a whole lot about what the government in this country is doing. And the question is, what are we going to do? How are we going to regain our courage, our wisdom, my favorite virtue of all, practical wisdom, the right re reason about doing actual things in the world, right? Um, how are we re going to regain our sense of what justice really is? How are we going to understand moderation, which also includes humility, the, the knowledge, the recognition we can't know what somebody else knows? One way I argue we're going to do it is by building an organized movement to oppose all of this. And there are places you can go, places you can start, and I'm happy to talk about some of those. But my dad was an actor, and he used to say, always leave them wanting more. So I'm going to stop there. <laughs>